Chapter 7 of Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts Many parts of Father Damien's tremendous parish were almost impossible to reach, would have been really impossible for anyone less strong of body and heart. One chapel was situated at the end of a twelve-mile journey through six deep gorges between rocky cliffs and with a final two-thousand-foot climb up a rock-faced hill. When it was just a question of exerting overwhelming personal effort, Father Damien was seldom delayed. The forces of nature sometimes offered more difficult problems. One Christian settlement was in a small cove around a spit of land, extending into waters that were often turbulent, always treacherous. But the people there were part of his parish, and the priest was determined to visit them. He was not sure of the number of baptized there, or of how vigorous the faith might be among them for they had been a long time without a priest. The only possible way to reach the spot was by boat. With an impulse of caution that was not usual in his planning, he postponed his departure until the water was relatively calm. One whole day of soft breeze and quiet sea seemed to him a signal of another good day to follow. So early the next morning he summoned the native who was to wheel the paddle, and together they entered their boat, a canoe-like craft made from a hollowed-out tree in much the style of an American Indian canoe. They put off from shore, and the little boat danced over sunlit waters, skimming along swiftly under the powerful strokes of the Kanaka. Father Damien became deeply absorbed in plans for work among these members of his flock, who had been for a long time without seeing a priest. His eyes roamed over the island, its lush green vegetation, its sudden rocky outcroppings, the tall cones of volcanoes thrusting into the sky. From one of the tips, a lazy plume of smoke arose waveringly to blend with the fleecy clouds. The beauty of the scenery did not detain his thoughts. He saw it as a series of challenges to be met in visiting his parishioners, as a setting in which he would construct a series of chapels. So concentrated was he on his various problems that for some time he was not fully aware that the Kanaka was speaking. But at last the words penetrated his consciousness. I do not like it, the boy was muttering. Father Damien looked up. You do not like it? The boy shook his head. The wind speaks of evil. The water is angry. The priest pulled his mind away from designs for the future to concentrate on the present. They had come a considerable distance, and the village of their destination was plainly visible on the shore. But around them on the sea, things were not so promising. He observed for the first time that the sky, which had been blue, was now gray. The sun still shone, after a fashion but as if it were coming through fog. The water, instead of dancing, was heaving in long, sullen rolls. The boy's descriptive word, angry, was apt. He was aware that there was now a field of danger between the boat and the village, which seemed so near. He had barely grasped the change in the scene about them when the boy shouted, Look out, father! Danger! A big roller, rising higher than the rest, lifted their little craft, turned it on its side, and then completely over. Father Damien's first thought was of his companion. For an instant, he feared that the boy had been caught beneath the capsized boat. Then he saw his head bob up on the other side of it. "'Can you swim, Father?' the boy yelled. "'Yes, but I am not really dressed for it,' Father Damien answered with grim humor. As the two struck out for shore, the priest was once again grateful for his boyhood in Trimaloo, where he and his brothers had spent many hours swimming in the Dial River. It seemed a long pull to the beach, but they made it at last. Father Damien, weary and trembling, since he had been hampered by his clothing. He started to press the water out of the soggy garments, only to discover, to his grief, that his bravery was gone. It was his only one, and particularly valued, because it was small and compact and fitted easily into his pocket. His heart sank, and he looked toward the water, as if moved to swim out again and hunt for the book he could not easily replace. But the water was wide, and the breviary was small. A quick smile flitted across his face, and he turned to the watching Kanaka. Let us first thank the good God, who brought us safe to shore, he said. Then we will go on to the village. The villagers were delighted to greet their new priest, and led him at once to the largest hut in the settlement, where they hoped to hear Mass. Not this time, Father Damien explained, but I will come again soon and bring all the Mass things with me. Even so, the day was a busy one for him. He baptized children born since a priest had last been there, visited the sick, spoke to the uninstructed. The next morning early, 
one of the men from the village went to the top of a small hill where he blew a series of blasts on a horn made from a conch shell. To all who heard it, the sound meant, The priest is here! From every direction there came scurrying men, women, children, hoping to assist at Mass, and when they found that impossible, anxious at least to go to confession, to say the rosary in unison, to receive instruction in their religion. Father Damien appointed two of the older, better trained men as prayer leaders to conduct services on the Sundays when he could not come. He preached a touching sermon about God's love for all. Then, in a bigger boat than the one from which he had been parted on the way in, he left the settlement and went home. Constantly in his thoughts was the urgent need of chapels. He could design them, he could even build them, but he needed money for land and for materials. In Honolulu, the office of the provincial, the priest in charge of the whole mission territory, began to receive a barrage of letters signed, Damien de Wooster. The provincial, while agreeing wholeheartedly with the young priest's desire, tried to point out to him that the covering of his parish with chapels would not be an overnight project. The plans were splendid, but their execution must necessarily be slow. But Father Damien did not know how to go slow. He decided to approach the Hawaiian rulers themselves. Kamahamaha V was king of the islands, and the priest wrote to his queen, asking her for a grant of land, and Hamakua, large enough to permit the building of a church. He received in reply the concession of a generous number of acres. On such a tract he envisioned a church, a school, perhaps, some day, even a convent, and a house for himself. Not long after he had secured this land, the provincial was able to send him some money. Now at last he would be ready to start building. The island trees were quite different from those he had been familiar with at Trimaloo. Here, instead of willow or oak, he must use wood of tamanu, or mango, and breadfruit trees. But he quickly learned their qualities, bought what trees he needed for lumber, and was ready to begin. There had never before been a chapel in the area where his land lay, and the natives were delighted with the project. Two Kanakas, familiar with the use of saw and hammer, were to be assistant carpenters several more volunteers as laborers. They began struggling with the great trees which had been felled, trying to move them from the forest to the spot on the mountainside where the chapel was to stand. For a while, Father Damien watched their efforts. Then, wanting immediate action, as usual, he made a lever of a stout branch across a rock, raised one of the huge logs slightly from the ground, and wedged it, got a good grip on it, and single-handed snaked it out into the open where the carpenters could work sawing it into boards. The natives stared wide-eyed with amazement at this new demonstration of the strength and skill of their beloved Camiano. The word spread quickly. Father Damien had land and lumber and was building a chapel. Eagerly men, women, and children volunteered their help. They gathered on the beach seven miles from the site of the building project and slept there in the cool breezes to prepare for the coming day. At sunrise they woke and recited their morning prayers in unison, then started the difficult climb up the mountain. Leaping from stone to stone because there was as yet no path, the children romped ahead, while the parents followed at a more sedate pace. There were tasks for all, clearing away vines and bushes, piling up the smaller stones, carrying tools for the workmen, and bringing them gourds of cold drinking water when the sun was high. No pair of hands was too small, no body too frail, to do its part in preparing a home for their lord. In so short a time as to be unbelievable, the church was finished, even to a beautifully polished two-foot cross on the roof. Father Damien was justifiably proud of the achievement, but he was not content. Soon, if God wills, he said, I will erect another chapel about twenty-five miles from here. He dreamed of the time when he would have a series of chapels all around his tremendous parish. Even without a church building, of course, souls can be saved but he knew that no Catholic group can function normally for very long without a fixed center, a place where Mass is said and the Holy Eucharist is tabernacled. Then, too, the priest was aware of the impact of church ceremonies and ceremonials on the beauty-loving Hawaiians. Flowers, lights, pictures, the incidentals of liturgical rites moved the natives strongly towards appreciation of supernatural truths. From his Belgian ancestors, Father Damien had inherited an ability to manage money, when he could get any, and the rather shrewd business sense. Now he raised crops that were in demand, such as string beans, tobacco, and so on, and exchanged them for supplies for his mission. The paint for his chapels, which steadily increased in number, was bought from the sale of potatoes. He had judiciously stored his potato harvest until the arrival of the whaling fleet brought him a big market for the vegetable. 
In the spring of 1865, Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, giving slaves their freedom. Fenians in Ireland were fighting for freedom. There was war between Paraguay and Argentina in South America. But even if he had heard of these events, they would have made little impression on Father Damien, for it was in that spring that nature decided to show the young missioner just what could be done by the elements. The Hawaiian Islands are volcanic in origin. Many of the cones constantly smoke and rumble, and, on occasion, a lava lake in the center of some cone will boil up and over, the edges rolling down the mountainside and destroying all that it touches. In early March of 1865, there were a few ground tremors, disturbing but not too frightening. As the month progressed, they came oftener and lasted longer. It was evident that there was some major disturbance in the earth, that some catastrophe was in the making, of which these tremblers were merely a forewarning. Suddenly, on the 2nd of April, one of the mountains literally blew its side out, and the earth heaved in a paroxysm that opened a 25-mile-wide crack, which at once filled with a river of stones and mud. Some poor souls who had escaped being buried in the debris of the exploding mountain were engulfed by this new horror. The air was filled with demonic noise. Giant boulders dislodged from rocking hillsides crashed down through forests, splitting and felling great trees, which die with a screaming rend of wood. Birds, terrified by this disturbance of their quiet jungle, flew distractedly about, and the shyest of animals left their rocking lairs and fled into the settlements. But there was no quiet there. Sobbing prayers of terrified people were drowned out by the frenzied clangor of church bells ringing in their rocking steeples without the aid of human hands. Cows bawled for calves which had fallen into earth fissures. Lambs bleated for ewes lost in rock slides. The sulfurous air was filled with dust from the multiplied wreckage that obscured the sun but reflected the volcanic glow. It was hard to distinguish day from night or night from day. Father Damien had trained a number of catechumens to instruct and catechize, to lead the prayers and read the gospel on Sundays when he could not reach their chapels. Many of them were buried in stone and rubble along with the chapels they loved. Then nature decided to show her versatility. Under the water, far out at sea, several volcanoes were preparing to erupt. As an athlete might draw a deep breath before trying some feat of strength, the undersea mountains drew the water out from the shore, leaving an uncanny nakedness on beach and waterline. Breath having been gathered, the waters were spewed out in a rushing, ravaging tidal wave that swept everything before it. Boats, houses, animals, men, women, children, all were carried away by the swirling fury. The very boulders which had stood sentinel at the ocean's edge vanished into its depth. For a brief time late on the night of April 6th, there was a pause, a cessation of the commotion. This in itself was nerve-wracking. It was obviously not the end of the days of disaster, but an interval, while nature gathered her forces for one more fearful blow. On the morning of April 7th, a great volcanic mountain erupted through half a dozen vents all around its circumference. Molten, glowing, sometimes sending weird fingers of flame high in the air as escaping gases ignited, the deadly streams poured down the mountain in all directions. For anyone who might be in their path, there was no way to run, no way of escape. Then, as if exhausted from its orgy of destruction, the earth was still. Father Damien was everywhere at once. He found shelter for the shelterless, he visited the sick, he buried the dead, he fed the hungry and gave drink to the thirsty. He consoled the widow and the orphan. And he set to work to rebuild all that had been destroyed. Two years later he could report that once again his chapels were standing, that his mission had a small flock of sheep, a cow, five horses, two colts, and two mules. By 1872 he was satisfied that he at last had enough chapels and rectories with farms to support them. He planned now to give more time to study, in which he knew he was lacking. But God had other plans for him. End of chapter 7 Recording by Maria Therese